Has anybody ever asked you what it would be like to hunt lions? Do you ever grow up on stories of hunting lions or people that hunted lions or mighty men who hunted lions? This is definitely gonna fall into the becoming a gibberim kind of series because last I left many of you in that series, I just got into a lot of the super good stuff, you know, like David finally becoming king in Hebron and Saul, Jonathan, and his sons all dying. It's a brutal, intense story. But the other day, I was reading in the scriptures all about lion fighters. Because it's not just that, you know, there's guys out there hunting lions. Sometimes there's lion guys hunting men. Do you know about this? Read with me for a second, shall we? Because there's some super fascinating characters that pop up in David's gibberim. You know, David's mighty men of valor. Gibberim, you guys, if you didn't know, I have a whole series called Becoming a Gibberim. It's like 23 or 24 parts long, but it's all about becoming a mighty man of valor, becoming a mighty person of valor. Gibberim can mean quite a bit of things like giant also. So most people that know the phrase Gibor or Gibberim, they kind of refer to it or have connected it and yoked it to Nimrod because he's the one who built the Tower of Babel in Genesis. We talk about he became a mighty man or he became maybe a giant. He corrupted himself or kind of made himself prideful. Gibor or Gibberim can also be like tyrants. You know, the people that kind of rule over everybody. They're the ones who kind of want to hold the power over everybody. Later on, if you read in the scriptures towards the end of the book, it talks about these people who have the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. Do you all know what the doctrines of the Nicolaitans are? These are super bad guys, way up on the list of not good guys in the stories when it comes to don't hang out with these people and don't try to be like them. But the Nicolaitans are people that really absorb a spiritual desire to rule over people, like to dominate and control people and to like gather up all of the power and hold it themselves and refuse to let it go. This is like what Saul became guilty of at his in his uttermost prime of his life. When he should have been the reigning king over Israel, he instead spends every single day of his life thinking and devising ways how he can murder David. It's terrible. Terrible. He's wasting his life trying to hold on to his power instead of realizing that that power comes and goes from the Father and it's not given to you by your own hand. So, but David has these mighty men that are listed out like in 2 Samuel 23. And I grew up on these stories. These were the stories that just all oh, got me so fired up for so long in my life. And I was like, I simply need to know what it's like to be Beniah. Okay, check this out. This is Beniah. 2 Samuel 22 is basically one of the most powerful prayers you've ever heard or and or read in your life. So I encourage you, go read that one out loud tonight before you slumber. And it'll give you mighty dreams or just give you powerful life. All right, check this out. Um, so you get this list of these dudes who go along and meet David who are basically discontent. They were in debt or they were more or less on the run, you know? These are people that were not the prime of society. A lot of them were the outcasts of society. But they end up doing these mighty feats of valor that list them in the Chronicles. Like the literal book of Chronicles has these dudes' names in it because they were so tremendous. And like one of them, for example, kills 800 humans at once. Like in one moment, in one occurrence, in one battle. He kills 800 human beings. Hand-to-hand -hand combat, y'all. Super savage. Ultimate savageness going down here. And then later on in this list, we read of this guy. You ready for this? And ben and, I'm reading from the Sefer translation because I'm going to probably be reading about other lion fighters that may not have these stories in your scriptures like Daniel. Daniel the lion hunter. Daniel the fighter with lions. You'll, you'll see where I'm getting at here. Check this out. Bena, and this is uh, 2 Samuel 23 verse 20. And Benayahu, the son of Yahuyada, the son of a valiant man, of the Kitzavel, who had done many acts, he slew at two lion-like men of Moab. He killed two lion men of Moab. You get this for a second? There are actual creatures out there who had the heads of lions and then kind of the rest of the body of a man. Like this is real life stuff. You know what I'm saying? Because the Bible's a history book, remember? The rest of the world's a lie. Here, I'll roll in pictures of skulls of humans that kind of look like this. 
and people for thousands of years that have basically carved and shaped images that show you this. Because there's these things out there called the Nephilim, longer story, hybridized human beings. They mingled themselves days of Noah, but days before that. They corrupted the images of the earth. But then there's these lingering aftershocks of that after the flood. And this is some of the race of those. There's apparently in Moab some children of these people. And they have the heads of lions. And later on we learn they can outrun a gazelle, which can run 60 miles an hour. A gazelle can run 60 miles an hour in mountainous terrain. And it says these dudes, these lion-like men of Moab, can also run 60 miles an hour. Crazy. Check this out. But this guy, Benayu, he slew two of them and he earns a name among the rest of them. He also slew a lion in the midst of a pit in a time of snow. And he slew a Mitzrayite at a goodly man or a giant. And the Mitzrayite had a spear in his hand, but he went down to him with a staff and plucked at the spear out of the Mitzrayite's hand and slew him with his own spear. These things did Benyahu, the son of Yahuwah, and had the name among the three mighty men. He was more honorable than the thirty, but he attained not to the first three. And David set him over his guard. So this guy, for defeating these lion-like men of Moab, these lion-faced men of Moab, and killing a lion in a pit on a snowy day, and killing a giant Egyptian who had a spear in his hand, he fought him with a stick. He fought a giant who had a spear in his hand with a stick, one, took the spear out of his own hand and killed him with it. So just for reference, Goliath also was killed not by David's stone, but by Dave, by Goliath's own sword. So there's this real serious principle that you're going to learn about lion hunting or about giant hunting that oftentimes you don't have to bring your own weapon. And this is really, really important because Daniel's weapon is obedience when he fights lions. David's weapon is also obedience when he fights the lions. Oh, Benayus, all of these guys, you're going to see this. The most powerful tool in your arsenal is obedience to your father's commands. It's genuinely your super weapon. You know how I know this? Because the entire Bible says so. It's fantastic. And I love finding stories that talk about fighting lion men. You know what's so great though? David not only fights lion-like men of Moab and has lion killers in his club, in his team of Gibberim, David also recruits them, which is fantastic when you think about it, because most of us don't grow up on stories telling you that you should recruit the bad guys, but I'm definitely all about it. So if you're one of the bad guys who the world likes to point out as like, you're the monster in the room, I think you have a fantastic place in the kingdom and it's right at the father's side because you should be advancing the kingdom of Yahuwah with every bit of gusto and zealousness that you have in you. So here's another one. Check this out. Oh man. This is 1 Chronicles 12, verse 8. And the Gadim there separated themselves unto David into the hold to the wilderness. They were men of might and men of war, fit for the battle, that could handle shield and buckler, whose faces were like the faces of lions and were as swift as the rose upon the mountains. So David now, because of his mightiness and his outrageous love for the Father and his instructions. Remember, David writes the Psalms, like the Psalms. Many of these Psalms he literally wrote in the company, in the presence of these lion-faced men of Moab. And now these are the Gadites. Sorry, Gadaim? Man, bear with me. Some of these transliterations of Hebrew names are so spectacularly difficult for my tongue to articulate. But I'm learning. Anyways, the Gadim were a bunch of people that lived up in the wilderness. And they also are apparently people that had lion-faced men who lived among them. Two of them, or some of them, separated themselves from among those people and they came and joined David because David was so fantastic. People, even from the enemy's camp, paid attention to what he was doing. And they noticed how he lived his life in such a way that they themselves, you know what, turned tail on their enemies and they became David's compatriots. They became the people that literally wandered the wilderness while Saul was trying to murder David the whole time. Remember, these are the same people that accompany David into the kingdom when he becomes the king over Israel. You're going to notice that as the story goes along, David has the armies of Israel that are under Joab's command. But then it will also say things like, 
and also the mighty men went with them. Because these dudes are like a super weapon army unto themselves. They're completely set apart from the rest of the armies of Israel. And these are the guys who were the outcasts and the rejects who came to David at his most vulnerable time. And they bound themselves together and they followed after their father's voice and learned his instructions and clung to his ways. And they became a set apart people, even amidst the greatest unification that Israel had ever encountered in their time. These men did not forsake David in his greatest hour of need, all the way at the very end of his life when the rebellion and the conspiracy of Absalom took place. These mighty men still accompanied David into the wilderness. And Daniel is one of those people who we read about in scripture that likewise had his compatriots accompany him into exile, into the wilderness. Because Daniel, if you didn't know it, was one of the children of Israel who was taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar, who came in and destroyed Jerusalem. He's the one who's responsible for taking the tribe of Judah and plundering it and drawing it away and putting it into captivity as part of their punishment for becoming whores and serving the other Elohim, the Elohim Achrim, these other gods. When they did that, they put themselves under the yoke of a taskmaster that was wicked and horrible, Nebuchadnezzar. But you can hear a little bit more about that story in my last video. So go check that one out. I'll put a little picture link in there for you to hang on to it. But we're going to jump into Daniel chapter 6 because this is just spectacular. You ready for this? Daniel as a child when he got taken into captivity. The father gives him and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which are their Babylonian crazy names, right? Their uh, Hebrew names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, they've got some of the most mighty prayers you've ever not read in your life. The Sefer translation, which is one I'm a big fan of, includes the prayer of Manasseh and the prayer of Azariah, which are incredibly powerful super weapons in your arsenal. This is the whole story you grow up on about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego going in the fiery furnace because they refuse to bow down to this massive image that Nebuchadnezzar builds and sets up. And then an angel of Yahuwah comes down and stands in the fire with them. Well, after that, or kind of amidst that, as they're coming out of the flames, Azariah, or Abednego, the name Abednego, he has this incredible prayer. And it is one of the most potent little super weapons you've ever seen in your life. So I encourage you to read it. I'll put a little bit of a link in the description below, and maybe you can just click it and see it there. Or maybe I'll just put a picture in now and you guys can see it. So check it out. That's the prayer of Azariah. But the father, because they regarded their bodies as precious and refused to eat unclean foods, the father blessed them with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And to Daniel, he gave him the interpretation of dreams. Now, Daniel and Hezariah, Mishael and Azariah, they rise in position and they get promoted in this kingdom of all the bad guys. Don't forget, we're in Babylon now in this story. This is literally like the epitome of bad news places to grow up. Like this is not the city you want to dwell in if you have to. For a lot of people, this is the iconic images of like growing up in Rome. Like in Rome, like some of you, it's in New York, California. We have these like horrible bad list places in a lot of our heads because we're brainwashed by the world into thinking that, you know, these things are the way they are. But the reality is there's still human beings that live in these places and they just grow up there and they have to be raised there. And the father calls them out of that place. Like Abram, Abram was a man who literally was in Babylonia. He lived in those lands, in the Chaldeans. And he scattered himself and was living in and around the worst kinds of people on the face of the earth. And yet, the father was with him wherever he went. And so too was the father with Daniel because Daniel continued to press into obeying his father. And the father loves that. Every person who's ever had children wants your children inherently to want to obey you, to do good. Like to, to, to follow after you and, and to do the things that you instruct them to do. Not just because you tell them to, but because they desire it. Like that's the kind of obedience that's full of love, that's beautiful. And you want to bless that. Daniel, now we'll pick it up in chapter six. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was the first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princes because an excellent ruach or spirit was in him. 
and the king thought to set him over the realm. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find an occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none, nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the Torah of his Eloah. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, and the princes, the counselors, and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any Eloah or man for thirty days, save you, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medin and the Persians, which alters not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber towards Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his Elohim as he did aforetime. Pause real quick. Daniel, just just for what it's worth, y'all, we are being rapidly thrown into a society where it is illegal and going to be readily persecuted for us to live in freedom, like in an actual way where our faces are exposed before men. Like, but there's some super important verses that forbid us from hiding our faces before men. I'll roll in just some of those right now. I strongly encourage you to live dangerously every single day of your life because think about this for a second. You are a perpetual witness of the Elohim that you serve. Every single man, woman, and child out there is a witness to what they believe. Out of the overflow of their heart, their mouth is speaking. And if they sign laws and put decrees into action, which go against the instructions that you have from your father in heaven, you, like Daniel, have every right to walk in obedience to this first. And you know what's so beautiful? This is how you hunt lions. You hunt lions by obeying your father in heaven. Because inevitably, inevitably, lions will come after you. It's going to happen. Do you realize these guys who come together, it says these presidents and princes sought occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they couldn't find any fault with him? That's because his life was upright. He was a righteous man. If you walk in obedience to this, like there's 10 commandments, follow those. All the rest of them, hang on those. If you walk in those, people can't find occasion against you unless they invent a law that makes you transgress your Ten Commandments, then they can get you because they know if you don't keep, if you continue to obey your father's instructions, you're going to break some other law. You know what's great? Daniel breaks that law and makes a public show of it. He goes and prays in private, granted, like he normally does, but he opens his windows and faces east towards Jerusalem. Just, just think about this for a second. I know there's some people that don't ever consider like why people maybe should pray towards Jerusalem, but Daniel definitely did. And he's not the only one who does it. It's definitely an occasion here that's super important and a crux point to the story. But he opens his windows and prays towards that place for a reason. Solomon also, when he was dedicating the temple, told what he said that there would come a day when exiles will pray towards this temple. It's an important thing. And so it's just something for you to consider. But when you want to hunt lions, these people had clearly a den full of them in reserve as a place of just nightmares for bad guys, right? We have them all over our country. We call them different things like prison cells, right? We have a different kind of lion's den that's out there in private. They're basically private systems, you guys. You guys gotta understand the, the massive prison industrial complex that exists. That is not the way you think it is. Most of us grow up thinking that's a place where they put bad people. That's a place where corporate criminals have facilitated an industry to support a bunch of thievery, lying, murder, and unbelievable corruption. It's an entire industry, you guys. That's our den of lions that exists predominantly here from the United States talking. We have the most incarcerated system of 
any kind of population in the world. It's a horrible nightmare and a giant mess. That's our giant den of lions. And you know how you get lions to be able to actually eat human beings? Because there's an interesting thing. The father created man and beasts to be co-laborers. In the beginning, we could work together. But after the fall, the father put the fear of man upon the beasts so that the beasts of the field and stuff, they fear us. They don't they don't predate upon us naturally. However, there are some instances of lions going crazy and predating upon human beings. You can even get lions to go after human beings. Generally, the way you do it is you have to remove the fear of men from them and or you have to get them convinced and addicted to eating human flesh and human blood because they need that in order to survive and suddenly begin hunting human beings because there's been some instances, you guys, of prides of lions, prides of lions from 1932, I think, to 1947. One pride of lions devoured 1,500 to 2,000 people, human beings, killed them. Lions, when lions lost the fear of men, they can do so much damage. Like, as in hunt you down and kill you, wipe you off the face of the earth bad. Like, there's a leopard out there that's killed like 500 humans. Unbelievable. These There's tigers that have killed hundreds of people, single tigers. Like, big cats, when they really are motivated, they will eradicate human beings off the face of the earth with incredible precision. But you normally have to change their environment to such a way like there's a bunch of people started killing off all of these livestock and all of the game animals that the lions were eating during those 1930s to the 40s. They started killing off and eradicating them to try to stop a virus, you know, those big bad viruses that are out there. So they killed all of the available food for everybody to eat, knowing all the lions to eat. So the lions started eating all the people. Crazy stuff. It's interesting that they're shutting the stores down so that most of us can't go there unless we put on a covering over our mouth and a, just a mark of oppression. If we go to the stores and we wear their mark of oppression and then we can get access to food, buy, sell, and trade, then we can be allowed in. But if not, you know, we have to go find somewhere else to hunt, which is why, just for what it's worth, when my wife and I went on the road, we sold our house, we just began traveling full-time in an RV, like... It's really expensive to do that, you guys. Like, it's incredibly expensive. There's some of you out there that have all jumped into, like, full-time RV lifestyle. And in a couple months, you're like, I can't afford this. I can't do this. We couldn't either. And we still can't afford it. I can't. People all the time invite us out to, like, hey, well, you guys should come and visit us. I'm like, it costs so much money. And I don't work full-time jobs at all. I volunteer full-time. I give away everything I do. I, nobody pays me money. Do you get what I'm saying? People pay me literally in salt. I got paid a pound of salt last week. I'm not exaggerating. It's the best salt on the face of the earth. It comes from the Sea of Cortez. And it's delicious and so good for your soul and full of micro minerals and tiny little phytoplankton and just fantastic little particles that come out of the sea in Cortez, which is one of my favorite bodies of water I've ever swam in. But I literally got paid a pound of salt last week. It was wonderful. And I sweat it all right back into the face of the earth. It was great. And then I got to eat bread from it. So the father has sustained my family through the generosity and the gifts of other people. And by the sweat of our faces, we go and live at people's farms and we volunteer on them. So they feed us. I literally work so my family can eat. That's the way I do it. Others of you have just stayed in RV parks or you stay in campgrounds and you're like, wow, this is brutal. I can't do this. Go live on a farm. Go live on a farm. Go learn a trade so that you can be a, con a positive contribution to people. Listen, farms always need weeders, especially natural farms. They need humans to weed all the time. And like there's like a hierarchy on a farm where you like start out and you basically start out by being a weeder. Like you're going to weed. But then if you do well, you can get entrusted with another task, like maybe planting. Maybe you're transplanting or maybe you're seeding or maybe you're pruning things or maybe you're chopping down trees because you're super good with a saw. Like you can get promotions on farms. It's just fantastic. And you know how one of my friends that I was building with a while ago, like I cut my finger with a saw. None of them wear gloves. I got to say this also. That's another whole new world to me. None of them wear gloves. Some of you guys are always asking, what is wrong with your hands? I work with them. That's why I have like permanent stains on my hands. I get chewed up constantly, blistered and cut up all the time because I don't work with gloves. And there's a lot of jobs maybe out there that you definitely have to wear gloves for. Some of them I definitely have done without gloves on and they just wreck my hands. But you know what? My friend looked over at me when I cut my finger with the saw, this one recently, when I did that with the saw and he goes, oh, promotion, promotion. <laughs> 
<laughs> and that's a great perspective because you know what the scars are? Promotions. Like, have you ever considered how many scars David had on his body? Like, think about this for a second. How many scars did the Gibberim have on their bodies? Like, one of the fi guys who fights, uh, he fights like 300 humans. I'm sorry, he fought in a, in a, in a field of lentils, which is just delicious. He fought a bunch of Philistines in a field of lentils until his hand was weary and stuck to the sword. Like his hand was so tired, it was basically stuck to the sword because he'd stabbed so many humans so many times. Like, you think he had some cuts and scrapes and bruises after a day like that? Like how many blisters do you get on your hand from holding on to something and swinging it so many times? I don't know, we've invented horrible, stupid sports like baseball. No offense to every one of you that have an idol out of sports, but it's time to smash that thing to pieces and pick up a real sword. It's called a machete. Go chop trees down and with an ax and a saw. Go learn real human skills that matter and can feed your family, but none of your sports are going to save you. They're going to ruin your soul and ruin your children. Teach them how to live. Teach them how to eat. Teach them what food is and what clothing is and what it takes to work in the kingdom. Like, we have a full-time job to be doing and there's not enough laborers out there because they're staring at a black mirror or they're putting on a uniform or they're putting on a mask so they can go play and pretend like they're doing something positive that matters. Sports are worthless. Kingdom work is eternal. So pick one, choose it, and go with it for all that you have in you. I didn't mean to go there, but it just, it's... There's so much work to be done in the kingdom and there's so many people perishing every single day and all I want to do is hunt their souls. And every time that I'd hear somebody open up and talk out of their mouth about something so worthless about people sitting around on a field running in circles or driving in circles or holding onto a pigskin all day long and we worship them, it's infuriating. Because there are people who labor day and night. Like, do you know how many people have sustained Chelsea and I that had nothing? Like, that had nothing. Like, the people that literally fed my family, clothed our family, or funded my family have almost always been the poorest people with the least amount of resources, with the least amount of space. Like, people have let us fit in their driveways who have exactly only enough space to fit our RV. And we have had to sit there and they have no extra money, and yet they fed us, they nourished us, they took care of us. They were the most hospitable people in the world. We've had people take care of us in ways that are miraculous. And it's almost always from those who are not bound up into the ways of this world. And they don't talk to us the same way that when I hear the majority of other believers' mouths open up and I hear them talk just like the world. It's so sad because they're missing out on the greatest harvest in the history of mankind. Those who have little in money. Like James. Here's the book of James. Getting a little distracted. That's all right. Hang with me. Brethren of mine, not be not in respect of persons. Guard the faith of our Adonai Yahusha Hamashiach of glory. For if there come unto your synagogue a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and you have respect to him that wears the fine clothing, and say unto him, Sit here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand there, and sit here by my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become the judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren. Has not Yahuwah chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor, do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called? If you fulfill the royal Torah according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the Torah as transgressors. For whosoever shall guard at the whole Torah and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not break wedlock, said also, do not kill. Now, if you do not break wedlock, yet if you kill, you are become a transgressor of the Torah. So speak ye, and do so, as they that shall be judged by the Torah of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that has showed no mercy. And mercy rejoices against judgment. So what does it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he has faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, and notwithstanding you give them not the things which they need for their body, 
What profit is this? Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. For a man may say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one Yah. You do well. The devils also believe this and tremble. But will you not know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered at Yisak upon the altar? See how faith wrought with his works and by his works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed Elohim and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of Elohim. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the rock is dead, so faith without works is dead also. By the way, Rahab basically lied and told the bad guys to go the other way so that the messenger sent by Joshua could escape and flee the city. She was justified there by her works. And it's such a powerful story. You guys have such an incredible testimony and have so much potential waiting in your mind and in your body and in his word and in his spirit to go forth and do mighty exploits because the world is starving right now. The world is starving for bold and courageous people who are obedient to their father in heaven and his instructions and who are peculiar and strange and set apart, who look around and see the needs of the people around them and give everything they have to everyone they can, including their enemies. Because listen, when Daniel gets accused, when Daniel gets set up to be forced into a situation that's going to make him break the law and make him potentially under an executable offense, Daniel doesn't go after his enemies, you guys. Daniel doesn't just post videos and post blog posts and make memes all about the bad guys and what they're doing. You know what Daniel does? He goes to his father and he talks to him and he does the daily things that have nourished him and sustained him. He consumes his daily bread. He studies and lives in this word and he prays to his father in heaven and he lets people see him doing it. Not so that he can be seen by men, but so that they know that he is not afraid of their commands and their instructions. You ready for this? Then they came near and spoke before the king concerning the king's decree. And they said, have you not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any Elohim or any man within 30 days, save of you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? And the king answered, said, the thing is true, according to the law of the Madi and the Persians, which alters not. Then answered they and said before the king that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Yahuda, regards not you, O king, nor the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto him, Now, O king, that the law of the Medea and the Persians is, that no decree nor statute which the king establishes may be changed. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spoke and said unto Daniel, Your Eloah, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his princes, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spoke and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living Eloah, is your Eloah, whom you serve continually, able to deliver you from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. 
My Eloi has sent his angel and has shut the mouths of the lions that they have not heard me. For as much as before him in innocency was found in me, and also before you, O king, for I have done no hurt. Then was the king exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no hurt was found upon him because he believed in his Elohim. And the king commanded and they brought those men which had accused Daniel and they cast them into the den of lions them, their children, their women, their, and the lions had the mastery of them and broke all their bones in pieces before they came to the bottom of the den. That part of that story stuck with me so profoundly because these lions, it's very clear, that had developed and cultivated in them the taste of flesh for men. They had become totally convinced that the best food on the face of the earth was man flesh. These are the literal lion nightmares. Like, there's this story, which is a true story, of these bridges that they were trying to build over a river. In, it's called Sava, I believe the Savo River. Anyways, they were trying to build this railroad all the way across a huge portion of Africa. Now, granted, it was probably a tiny little piece of Africa because it's so big, they don't even put it on your maps because all your maps are lies. Africa is gigantic. I spend a lot of time with Africans and you know what they don't tell me about? Ever crossing tiny distances because a small journey to them is literally like our giantest journeys ever. Canadians, you would get along great with Africans because you guys know how to cross some serious distances. Tremendous. I love you. Every one of you Canadians out there. Fantastic humans. I know you're not all in the tundra, but in my mind, you're all in the tundra, the barren wastelands, and you're mighty. Stay in there. Hang in there. Anyways, this, these two lions, check this out. Two lions begin hunting these humans because there's all these people are brought in to build this bridge to cross over this river. And guess what happens? These lions begin to hunt human beings, like tremendously effectively. These lions are so good, in fact, at hunting humans that they are dragging away dozens of them. Dozens of human beings are being dragged away and eaten by these lions. And they're big lions. Now, there was a famous movie that was made about this called The Ghost and the Darkness. And it was an intense movie. I don't necessarily recommend it because I'd rather you guys not look at black mirrors anymore. I'd rather you read the stories about lion hunters in here. But it's a pretty intense movie. And during this time, they bring in, obviously, lion hunters to try to kill them. Guess what? Not so easy. Because these lions are like 10 feet long huge lions and there's something very special about a lion known as stealthiness like they're incredibly smart and when there's more than one of them you're in trouble son because they work together and it's really bad news bears for you because they would drag people off they'd get them in their tents while they were sleeping which is terrifying and they would drag them off and eat them in a cave that they had full of human carcasses so that's bad enough well then they lost even more of their fear of men and they began to literally just drag people out of their tents and eat them right there on the spot. So then this made people really freaked out because the lions aren't even scared anymore. And then they start doing this stuff even at day. Like, these are like the worst case lions ever. Now, Daniel in Babylon here, it's like basically what happened. They went in and they caught those lions. Instead of just killing them, which is eventually what happened, they killed these two lions before they killed like basically around 200 people. There's lots of people who would like to go back and tell you that it was only maybe 30, 40, or 50. But it's definitely anywhere from 150 to 200-ish kinds of humans that died during this time that we know about. They end up shooting them and killing them. You can see those lions now. I'll show you some images of them. But those lions, which look like not scary at all because they're dead and they're stuffed and they're sitting in a museum in Chicago, those lions were the living embodiment of terrors. The people were really convinced then that these things were possessed by demons, which is also biblical. If you didn't know it, demons can possess things like pig, which is another reason why you shouldn't eat that poison. It'll kill your soul. It potentially give you a bunch of demons while you eat it. So something to consider. Where did Yeshua cast the demons out of the two men who were in the tombs when they were cutting themselves and living in the tombs naked? Remember, they all wanted to go in the pigs, and they did. So demons can fill up a bunch of pigs. Something to consider. Anyways, 
They kill these lions finally and stop the rampage. My conjecture is the lions that Daniel is facing when he gets thrown down into the pit. It's an entire pride of lions that were like that bad. Like village eating lions. Like the pride of lions from the 1930s that was killing 1,500 humans. It's like that. These lions are that bad. And I really didn't understand how it was possible for a human being to be dismembered before they fell and hit the ground. Until you see how incredibly good lions are at dismembering things. So I was watching some videos of lions attacking wildebeest and other stuff. Like they can lick skin off with their tongue. Like their tongues are so, just their tongue. Their tongue is so powerful they can lick skin right off an animal. Like just staggering how incredibly effective these things are at doing this. But Daniel, because of his steadfast obedience to the father, has one angel come down and literally deliver him and shut the mouths of all of those lions simultaneously. Daniel doesn't even have a mark on him. Daniel is literally unhurt. But you know who experiences the savagery of those animals? The very people who set Daniel up to die. The people who were put into this world to try to be the people that were raised up to destroy and murder Daniel instead get what's called mishpat, which is justice. What you do to others is done unto you. So like the way a lot of people right now are setting up the world and the system to try to crush and oppress and extinguish all of the good in the world and the society, the freedoms that we have enjoyed for so long, there's an entire industry that's being grown up to try to quelch and crush all of the righteous people. But you know what? The Father loves those people that are our enemies, you guys. And he longs for them to come into his kingdom. He desires for them to come into their kingdom. These people can be delivered. They can be saved. And you know what Darius did? Because of the, the evil conspirators that put all this into action, because of this, a great decree goes out. And listen to this. Then King Darius wrote unto all the people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the Eloah of Daniel, for he is the living Eloah and steadfast forever. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be unto the end. He delivers and rescues. And he works signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Koresh the Persian. Daniel's Elohim gets elevated. The people of all of the kingdom that the Darius had control over now heard and knew about the mighty Elohim that Daniel worshipped. That is our desire, is that we would live our lives in such a way that the people of the earth, even our enemies, even those who are the lions in the hiding in the darkness, would see the righteousness of his people, these set-apart and peculiar people who love fiercely and who obey fiercely. They guard fiercely the commands of their father. Like, the whole concept of Shabbat, the Sabbath, like he says to guard it over and over and over and over and over and over for a reason. Like he's telling you, guard my Sabbath. It's a sign between me and you forever. Like fiercely guard resting. Like that's such a beautiful concept. Like rest in peace. Shabbat Shalom. Like rest in peace. But at the same time, while you're resting, be vigilant. It's like a bodyguard. Do you know what I mean? Like I was a literal trained bodyguard, low profile bodyguard. And I would accompany super wealthy-ish people. And I would not look like I was a big, bad, scary bodyguard with the giant, huge mustache and the cool sunglasses and the body armor and the big AR-15 with all the modifications and the sweet reloads and all of it. I, was, I looked like a, a friend out for a visit with him. I didn't look like anything noticeable. But... If need be, I suddenly could go into action. Like I was quiet and calm on the surface, but underneath I was super on guard and looking out for you, son. Like that's the idea of Shabbat. Like you guard your resting. Like you really work hard. Like preparation day, for instance. On Friday, we do a savage amount of work. By that I mean a lot of that is my wife because she's a millinite. Do you know what I mean? She's milling grain like crazy and kneading bread. But I got in on some of the action recently and I even got to knead with her, which was fantastic. Well, hello. Well, hello. <laughs> I'm becoming a millinite. I just milled a lot of grain for the first time ever no oh the fourth time ever oh but it's okay. the first time i've ever mixed it from there hey now in this nifty little mixing bowl <laughs> so prepare thyself i even washed my hands before the making of this video show me your hands there's my hands 
Oh, There's more cuts on this hand. Oh gosh. Because I, oh, those I volunteer are, for a living. Those are working it's hands. Sharp, brutal, hard materials. Oh, it's warm. It's hot almost. Yeah. It's almost hot. Wow. This is fun, isn't it? Ooh. Come on. This is the Ooh, funnest this way to make hands. bread. Oh, it burns in the cuts a little. Too hot? Ooh, living bread. <laughs> Heal me. <laughs> Vitamin E. Oh, my hands hurt so bad every day. Oh. It's good. No, it's good. I need it in my life. Is it going to get more? Do we have more flour? Nope. We don't need any more oh, flour. Really? That's it? Uh -huh. It's a very wet dough. Oh, man. I'll say. I was really getting ready no, to get can't. my work on. Keep squishing it. Keep squishing it. Go ahead. Go ahead, just because it's fun. I have more to do if you'd like. Oh, let's cover up my thumb because it hurts a lot. Oh, gosh. Oh, Put great. a little healing dough on there. <laughs> let's get a little sap on there. Oh, good job, Nathan. Nice. Becoming a millionite. Oh, my. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, my. <laughs> You're having too much fun. Perfect. <laughs> oh my goodness. Isn't it fun? This is making oh, whole, oh, this one's hot again. <laughs> whole wheat artisan bread a little warm. Sorry. Do you feel like a DJ? No, I feel like a millionite. <laughs> oh gee. Fantastic. But we prepare work really really hard like we do two days work on friday so that on shabbat on saturday we get to sit down we get to feast and eat with friends or fellowship or just with our family and we get to break open the word and we get to rest with our family we get to rest and relax and we're not cooking the whole time and we're not cleaning the whole time and we're not getting all those laundry list of chores done on saturday because i grew up my whole life thinking saturday was the day that you did all the chores that you didn't get done the rest of the week but you know what? The Father gave us that day for us, and it's a blessing, and that is a super weapon. Because if we would sit down on the Shabbat, if we would not murder, if we would not steal, if we would not commit adultery, if we would not serve any other Elohim, if we would not bow down to these idols, if we would not hearken to the false instructions of the world, but if we would regard our Father's instructions and cling to Him, he will protect us from the lions. And in fact, he would use us as such a powerful witness that those lions would turn and they would instead work with us. They would co-labor with us. They would become part of his kingdom and walk with us as we pursue our Messiah's deliverance and life. And I want you guys to be fierce as lions. I want you guys to be bold and courageous and not willing that anyone should per perish. We don't want any of these people to die in their sins and in their transgressions. We want them to come to the fullness of the truth, that they could come to know the Messiah and they could be cleansed and healed and restored and given a new spirit like the spirit that Daniel had, that spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of understanding, like the reverence of Yahuwah, like the spirit of strength and counsel. Like we want people to be full of the power of the living Elohim. Like he is our mighty king and he is here to rescue us and save us. And I'm confident he will do that in his just right time. But you know what? Until that time, the father raises up our oppressors. Like Yahuwah raised up Nebuchadnezzar. He brought Nebuchadnezzar onto the scene. He's the one who made Nebuchadnezzar powerful enough to capture Jerusalem and to conquer that city. And you know what? In the same instance, the Father may have raised up many of these people to be our oppressors for this season, but we petition him that he would be merciful and turn away from his anger and bring us back into his mercy, to have mercy on us, to have compassion on us, just like David prayed at the threshing floor, that he would have mercy on us and that he would turn from his anger and chastise us no longer with the rod of the nations, but that he would discipline us with loving kindness and with mercy again. So I pray that you guys would be fierce to find ways to serve and love your neighbors, to care for them in the way you want to be cared for, to clothe the naked, to feed the hungry, to nourish those who need the truth and the bread of life. So give them the bread of life. Give them the truth. I love you. Live dangerously out there every single day of your life because the days may be evil, but you were born for such a time as this. I'll talk to you soon.